looks like. Well, good morning and welcome to VMworld. Now, as Rick was saying, uh, this is the fifth time that I've had the privilege of standing up here uh, and talking with you at a VMworld event. Mm -hmm. And I have to really thank all of you, to thank the broader community that VMware is part of for an incredible journey and for what we've been able to achieve over the last four years. If you go back to 2008, the analysts tell us at that time about a quarter of the world's Intel-based server applications were running on a virtualized foundation. Today, that number is greater than 60%. In other words, in the space of four years, we've been able to take virtualization as an interesting and growing approach to transformation in the data center and turn it into the default way of running applications. Now, that hasn't been done purely by technology. At the same time, it's been done by this growing army of VMware certified professionals that has uh, increased fivefold in that period of time. And this is really the body of people who've enabled this change. And I'd like to recognize and thank them for the crucial role uh, that they have played in our industry. So for all of you VCPs here in the audience, thank you very much. <laughs> Now, VMworld itself has been growing. We've uh, increased the size of the, the event by 50% over that time frame to the point where this is now the preeminent forum for coming together and discussing and learning about virtualization and all of the technologies that surround it. And lastly, of course, there's the key phrase, cloud. Back in 2008, we were asking ourselves, what the hell is it? <laughs> And uh, now we're really asking ourselves, what do we do about it? How do we actually implement it? Not just in technology, but in the, all the things that cloud can affect, and in particular, people and processes. So today we're coming to give you the latest in our technology to actually implement clouds, but complementing that for the first time with a deep body of how-to information how to use the technology, how to transform your operations to take full advantage of it. Now the question arises, of course, is what's gonna happen in four years' time? <laughs> Where are we going with this technology? <laughs> and I believe that where, this, where we're going is influenced by an enormous set of forces that are working through our industry, a set of forces that go beyond any of the buzzwords that we normally like to associate with cloud, mobilization, social, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that what's really happening is we're coming to the mature stages of a very successful 50-year journey to automate most of the paper-based processes in the world. If you think about it, in enterprises today, we've gone through general ledger, accounting, customer relations, catalog sales, messaging, all of that has been successfully turned into computer-based processes. And it's, as I said, been an incredibly successful journey to the point now where businesses are absolutely dependent upon these capabilities and they're not going to go away. However, this is, at this point, they're just table stakes. Every business in the world is expected to be able to do this. What's happening now is the imperative to deliver fundamentally new experiences to both end users and end customers. People want to experience information in fundamentally different ways. If you're a bank, simply being able to present a monthly statement as a web page instead of sending us a piece of paper, that is no longer innovative. We need to look at new ways of providing access to information in real time and above all in the context of what people are doing. 
And this has profound implications in what happens underneath because a lot of these new experiences can't be directly delivered on today's IT infrastructure. There's going to have to be fundamental innovation and change to allow people to bring together different streams of information, to be able to reason over those streams of information in real time and present a much more relevant, relevant experience to users in the context of who they are, where they are, and what they're doing. And it's these forces that I think are really going to have a big impact on our industry over the next four years. First and foremost, it's going to mean because we're going to have to get much more efficient about existing IT precisely in order to free up the time, the energy, and the focus to go after these new experiences. So the first order of business is how do we take our existing IT, make it fundamentally more efficient, more agile, thereby creating the possibility of really reaching forward to what's going to be important from a competitive point of view in the future. So we are going to see an equal transition in IT over the next four years than we've seen over the past four years. And you'll know that uh, we at VMworld like to think of this transformation in three broad categories. Firstly, it's the transformation of the underlying infrastructure. What's happening in the data centers? And we see ourselves going there from a physical world to a virtualized world to a cloud world. And that's fundamentally a journey about integration and automation. On top of that, we see a transformation in applications and data, because a lot of these new experiences can't be built with the traditional data fabrics. If you're gonna do things in real time and at scale, we need new ways of doing things. And lastly, there's gonna be a transformation in terms of how the results of this, these experiences are actually made available to end users. There's gonna be a transformation in how end users access and interact with information. Broadly speaking, going from a PC-dominated world to a mobile, multi-device world. And we at VMware are speaking to the transformation that we think needs to happen at every one of these layers. And most of this conference is gonna be drilling into these layers to understand what needs to happen and what technologies and capabilities we can make available to to start this journey right here, right now. Now you know that I love to talk about the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and start drilling down into this. And I think I've just been given a very subtle hint here. <laughs> that this is my cue, in fact, uh, to introduce the gentleman who is gonna be talking to you about the next four years, uh, who's a very good friend and colleague of mine. I'm very happy to be today formally handing over the custodianship of this community to Pat Gelsinger. Pat and I have known each other for 30 years. We first met when we were both wet behind the ears as junior engineers at Intel in the early 1980s and uh, developed a strong relationship, sometimes even a rivalry over the years when uh, I went to Microsoft and he remained as uh, head of product development uh, at Intel. But over the years, I've developed a tremendous respect and affection for Pat. Uh, you're gonna find out that Pat, if there's one thing about Pat, nobody can accuse Pat of being laid back. <laughs> Pat is passionate and intense. So fasten your safe, uh, safety belts for the next four years and enjoy the ride with Pat. Pat? <laughs> Take, take good care of her. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, you know, before I let you get off the stage, first, you know, Paul has been a friend, he's been a colleague, right? He's led VMware for four years now, an extraordinary success in the industry. And I'd like you to say thank you to my new board member one last time, Paul Moritz. Thanks, Pat. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, and it truly has been a pleasure working with Paul now for about 30 years, and, you know, he was a lot younger when we first worked together. For me, it's a pleasure to take the stage today, and I've known VMware for many years. In fact, in my Intel days, started to work with uh, VMware at its very foundations. In fact, I remember a meeting with Mendel, and it turns out that we had a meeting the day after the first vMotion was working, and Mendel was just giddy happy, right? You know, and we started to brainstorm. In fact, we were supposed to get on stage at an Intel developer forum, and Mendel and I held up the, the event by about 10, 15 minutes as we were brainstorming all the use cases for vMotion. So from its very beginning, I've had a great respect, excitement for all the things VMware and the possibilities that it has. And I want to reiterate Paul's comments, right? This is a period of great disruption uh, in the industry where the infrastructure, the applications, and the access layer are all being changed simultaneously. The last three years at EMC have been you know, fabulous in many ways for me. But one thing that just really stood out, if you're at EMC headquarters in Hopkinton, you get to look out over the carnage of the mini computer industry, seeing the buildings of DEC, Data General, and Prime. And it clearly is those companies that ride these waves of change effectively have great success. And those that don't end up being washed up on the shore. Personally, I'm committed to the strategy that Paul has laid out. And I view my role as CEO for VMware to accelerate, refine, and deliver on this powerful vision that has been described. Let's begin by looking a little bit more closely at the infrastructure layer. And to me, this is a great opportunity because for 30 years I've labored at the hardware side and now I get to flip it over and be on the software side, building on that infrastructure of multi-core x86. And it's exciting to sort of finish the job, right, with the software layer that can run on top of that hardware infrastructure. You know, as Paul noted, we've made great progress in the workloads that we've virtualized. But I like to set out a very audacious goal for us as a group, that we would get to 90 plus percent over the next three or four years running as virtualized workloads, where the rare exception would be a workload that isn't running on a virtualized x86 environment, sort of like some of those leftovers that you stick in the back of the closet and you hope you never have to look at again, right? Some of those leftover workloads are the only thing left that we haven't done. Furthermore, that we see that we need to continue to make dramatic improvements in provisioning. And clearly in the virtual world, we've accomplished a lot, right, in getting to days and hours, but our objective has to be to minutes or seconds where everything is provisioned simply as a service, automatically. You know, if we think back just a few years, the provisioning of a new computer would have taken weeks. And if we add procurement, installation, hardware time, you know, could have been months or even quarters to get it done. And with the magic of virtualization, it clearly is much better where we're now able to do this in days or hours. However, right, we see that there are many aspects of this that still require physical or manual intervention, you know, networks and security uh, aspects and storage aspects. And all of these are heavily manual and physical operations even today. And the challenge is, can we make those as easy as it is to deploy a VM as we look forward, making each of these automatic? And can we create a container, right, a virtual data center that includes not just the apps, right, and the VM, but all of the other services that would go with it, the virtual data center of the future? Clearly, this is the promise of the software-defined data center. And uh, I'd like you to look carefully at this definition, right? Steve Harrod has worked and made sure every syllable in this definition is precise and accurate, right? And as you look at it, all infrastructure is virtualized, okay, amongst the VMware faithful, that's easy, right? And delivered as a service, so all of those infrastructure mechanisms are embodied and delivered as a service, and the automation of that is entirely done by software. Right, and I spoke here in 2007, and when I spoke, like, how many of you were here in 2007? How many of you remember the speech I gave? Oh, I hope a few of you would have, but anyway, I liked it at the time. Um, but one of the things I said in that speech at the time was that the opportunity for VMware was to establish the data center-wide operating system. 
And I think that is still the opportunity that we have today. And in fact, the words we would use today is the software defined data center. But if we go look inside of the data centers of today, what we see is a museum of IT past. In fact, we see these silos of different infrastructure that largely from the app forcing different choices of infrastructure. And in fact, database vendors today are arguing, let's make it even more vertical and more proprietary than it was before. Right? Our mainframe vendors are selling the same story of 20 years ago, that the only way to do mission critical is in fact with our unique infrastructure. In some ways, we're building yet the new island, the Hadoop island. Right, where yet again, it needs to be its own unique hardware infrastructure or high performance computing where even the slightest overhead cannot be tolerated. Our view of this is it's time to move on. And in fact, we have to do what we've done for compute and memory to the rest of the elements of the data center. We need to abstract it, we need to pool it together, and then finally automate it. And this is essential to deliver the data center of the future, the entire data center being delivered as a set of services and enabling just-in-time service creation for everything that we do. The software-defined data center is exactly that. It's bringing together one common platform for all the data center applications, existing and new apps. And now the question is, can it be done? Last year, we announced the intent to deliver vCloud Suite, a cloud suite of bringing together all of these components. And today, it's my great pleasure to announce this suite. And it starts, of course, with proven infrastructure. And this is what vSphere is and right, you know, has delivered in a powerful way today over 400,000 customers. But, this, but vSphere has become much more than that. In fact, it's become the entire cloud infrastructure, which includes with it right, the networking and security functions, and many of those that we'll be talking about in more detail today. It also includes storage and availability uh, capabilities. It also includes a standardized service catalog with self-service uh, capabilities against that to deliver all of this infrastructure on demand. It also includes a set of management uh, capabilities, a new approach to management, putting behind the ITIL and CMDD environments of the past, and a management environment that's purpose-built for cloud error versus traditional scripting. And uh, you know, think about it as software, automating software. And finally, we need to federate this pool with other pools of infrastructure as well, with extensibility and APIs. And bringing all of these together, the first and only holistic suite for delivering the cloud infrastructure, making it easy to buy, install, and use. Now, the vCloud suite is unmatched in the marketplace. First, of course, comprehensive. All aspects of infrastructure and management are part of it. Second, unquestionably highest performance. And today we're announcing vSphere 5.1, improving on the best, the best in terms of performance, in terms of jitter, in terms of VM density, making it even better. This, the ninth major release of the vSphere software base. And you know, at Intel for 30 years, and I was part of the team that helped create the TikTok development model that every year we would deliver a major new microprocessor and we had our major and minor, right, the talk and the tick cycle to go with it. And lo and behold, VMware is doing exactly the same, a yearly cadence of major software releases to have as a competitive advantage new features and new capabilities coming into the industry. And today we continue that with vSphere 5.1. But it's also proven. 100% of Fortune 500, 100% of the Global 100, 400,000 customers. IDC estimates that over 60% of x86 workloads are now running virtualized. And Gartner estimates that over 80% of those are running on VMware. So quick math, over 50% of all x86 workloads running on the VMware infrastructure today. This is a powerful, powerful position that we are growing and rapidly expanding in the industry. But one more point that I wanted to cover is we heard you. 
We conducted a very comprehensive customer survey of over 13,000 of you. And first, I just want to say thank you very much for the feedback, the passion, the enthusiasm that you all demonstrated in talking back to us as we asked through the survey. And while there's enormous enthusiasm, there was also one point very loudly that came back is change your pricing. How many of you liked last year's pricing changes? Okay, oh, one person did, okay, good, right? Uh, you know, and, and if you have the, you know, if in the alphabet, Apple has claimed I, right? Well, VMware has claimed V, you know, V everything, V coffee, V drink, hey, you know, we got all the Vs, but last year we created a V four letter dirty word called VRAM. Well, today I am happy to say we are striking this word from the vocabulary, right, of the V dictionary. Now, I thought you guys would be excited about this. I, the, the team told me it would be a standing ovation when I said we were killing VRAM, right? So let's get excited a little bit. The end of VRAM. Today, I'm also happy to announce that we've made it simple, very easy, one integrated solution, no VRAM entitlements, no core entitlements, no VM per, per VM pricing components, all one easy model per CPU, per socket, easy to buy, install, and use. Okay, that's it, we're done. <laughs> but we also listened very carefully, and you know, we clearly heard that the technology is important, and what we're doing with vSuite is very, very powerful. We also are updating uh, vCAT, the cloud architecture toolkit. But another thing that we heard in our feedback is, tell us more about how to use it and operate it not just what the technology is. And today I'm happy to announce the cloud ops capabilities, a set of education IP and services that address the rest of the problem. Right? It addresses the issues of process and control, operational readiness tools, a set of advisory services that go with it, and resources to help you get there. It also includes people, process, and org, because once we've introduced this radical new way to do cloud computing in the data center, the organization of the old vertical silos isn't appropriate. We need to change the organizational model. We need to have new best practices in it. We also have to have new skills and new people. And we're also today rolling out right, a set of new role-based certifications to enable you to continue to advance your career right, as cloud architects for the future. We're also rolling out a set of business management tools to give cost-benefit analysis, to be able to help you move on this journey right, toward a fully um, you know, uh, best practices environment for service level accounting, right? so that there's true billing and bill back uh, capabilities for the businesses that you support. Right? Simply put, right, it's the tools and the services to help you navigate this change. But we can't do this alone. In fact, right, we've partnered with the leading advisory competence in the industry and today are announcing the formation right, of the Cloud Ops Forum. These companies, leaders in their respective industries, fields, vertical segments, partnering with us to deliver these services to you right, to accelerate our journey to the cloud. But we also heard you very clearly that it's a multi-cloud world. And with that, as hard as we're working toward a homogeneous all VMware environment, we know that sadly there's these other pockets of infrastructure that we need to support as well. And with that, we began that journey very powerfully with our Cloud Foundry efforts, the one and the only multi-cloud PaaS environment that supports both VMware pools as well as uh, Amazon and others in the future. In addition to that, we acquired Dynamic Ops, and part of the motivation behind this was to extend our vCloud director capabilities to cover cross-cloud, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, desktop as a service environments, and set in place a common storefront for policy-based provisioning of workloads on any cloud. 
And finally, and maybe most significantly, was our recent acquisition of NYSERA, being able to take the environment of the software-defined network and extend it for the open community and bring that into the family of VMware uh, capabilities uh, as well. The leading OpenStack, open source offering in the industry today. And today I'd like to solidly and clearly reaffirm VMware's commitment to the ongoing participation in the open community, to the open stack community, our continuing support for open source and quantum by continuing contributions there. We are right, happy to be extending the role of our community to that participation in those set of products as well. And I'm also very happy to say the deal closed. Right? As of Thursday night at 11.59, NYSERA became part of the VMware family and welcome to that team joining us. And simply put, VMware is committed to support multi-cloud environment today and into the future. So we've covered the infrastructure. And now, you know, and, and with this, it's a powerful vision, right, of the software-defined data center. But beyond that, we see that, what about the applications layer, right, and how we help modernize today and enable tomorrow's cloud era. Last quarter, we had a major update to our vFabric uh, platform, right? As part of that, uh, we see this premier platform for Java and Spring development to be further extended. We've also invested in seeing that there's an increasing requirement for big and fast data capabilities. And we're attacking that through our gem, right, and our gem SQL uh, activities, as well as through our vFabric data director as two examples of that. We're also very committed to the Cloud Foundry effort, the one and the only open PaaS environment in the industry today. In 2012, we've seen 160% growth in downloads, over 100% growth in the apps running on that infrastructure, and now we have over 30 partners joining with us in utilizing Cloud Foundry. Today it's in beta, in Q4 it goes to production, and next year, importantly, we'll offer the private cloud version so you can host it with VMware, with other public clouds like Amazon, as well as in your own data centers as well. Also, it's extending the access and delivering the tools required for the mobile social workforce of today and tomorrow. It's not about users, it's not about devices, but about users uh, going uh, forward. We're very happy with the progress of our VUE assets, and VUE today continues to gain share, about growing at about 2x the industry average. We also recently completed the Wanova acquisition and their Mirage technology. Centrally manage and secure all PCs, whether those PCs are virtual, whether they're physical, whether they're thick or they're thin, all centrally managed and secure in one cohesive way. Our horizon efforts, working to establish the broker for the cloud era. And while I don't want to steal too much of Steve's thunder for tomorrow, as this will be discussed in detail, you know, clearly we're excited to make this the broker for access, for applications, for data, and desktop across the full range of devices that users would have. So in summary, we've covered this top to bottom transformation, radical changes at the infrastructure, entirely new ways of developing applications for tomorrow, and finally, a focus on mobile and social users and establishing the infrastructure for them as well. Right here, right now, we're delivering the tools for this radically changing IT environment that Paul described, we're in, and we're looking forward to a powerful future of that. But one more thing before I close. It's not possible without you. you know, as I described, I'm committed to execute the same strategy that Paul has established for VMware. And as Joe described when we launched the change of leadership, that we're committed to the same structure. VMware is and will remain an independent company. And it's my job as the CEO to continue driving forward and working closely with you, our partners, and our ecosystems. In my 30 years at Intel, right, I've worked with many of you, and I'm actually quite looking forward to resuming many of those uh, relationships and picking up right where we left off. 
and I'm deeply invested and have seen the power over my career of the partner ecosystem that VMware has and has worked on so well and so effectively over the last 10 plus years. So I want to say thank you. To me, right, this is a great honor and a privilege to join with you in this journey. And I'm looking forward to the next decade or two, right, of VM Worlds and the powerful community that we're building. It's now my great opportunity to introduce uh, Steve Harrod, who will carry the bulk of the load with regard to our products and strategies. Steve, you know, what can you say about a guy who's that young, that smart, that capable, that influential? Man, what a guy. And with that, you know, to you, right, you know, Steve is somebody who needs no introduction, and to me, a friend and colleague that I'm excited to pass the clicker to right now. Thank you. I'm good, great job. Hey, good morning. I wish I could dance like those guys did, that was pretty cool. Um, I just wanted to open by saying, you know, it has been a real, real privilege to work with Paul over the last four years and certainly to learn quite a bit. Um, he's reminded me he's going to be darkening many a door uh, to keep working with us. And it's also great, obviously, to have Pat here, uh, very passionate, very technical. So I think we're in extremely good hands uh, headed forward. Uh, so once again, favorite day of the year as we get to talk about what's going on. And it's a real privilege to represent the work of more than 14,000 VMware employees uh, watching this webcast from Palo Alto and Cambridge and Beijing and India and all over the world in Sofia. And I, I just wanted to thank everyone for their work. You're going to see a tremendous amount of effort they put into what we're launching today. And everyone should be proud. So again, as Pat said, we're really looking at how we're going to do transformation of IT, and we're looking at it from all of the major um, aspects of what we do, how we and where we run our applications, how we build applications, and then tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time about how we consume those applications. But what we're going to do for the next 45 minutes or, go, or so is really focus on infrastructure, talk about the new vCloud suite, and talk about how it's going to change the way that we run IT. So Pat showed you this picture, which is something that should be familiar for a lot of you. We've spent a lot of time working on vSphere, and I want to share a lot of the advances in the latest release here. But what's also exciting is when you combine this firm foundation with a lot of the capabilities on top of it. So I also want to show the other components of the suite that are pulled together in a nice integrated package for the first time. This is how we work with networking and security, storage and availability, and most importantly, how we pull that all together through management, and more importantly, automation. Uh, this really represents massive development and even more test work going on to deliver this, the first integrated offering that's great for both private clouds and public clouds. And I want to step back a little bit to just reiterate how Pat talked about the virtualized data center that's part of this. The software-defined data center is about taking more than just the compute and the memory side of things, and it's about more than just being a hypervisor. It's really about virtualizing all of the different components that you have in a data center and pulling them together into what we call a virtual data center. In fact, in many ways, we've shifted from having VMs be the unit of focus for the company to certainly having VMs there, but really we want to provision and operate a virtualized data center just as easily as we've been doing it with virtual machines. Uh, Raghu likes to talk about this as the same way you might go into a co-location service and get a rack. You're going to go fill it up with storage and networking, maybe a traffic manager system. You want to pull that all together and consume it. That's exactly what these new virtualized data centers are. They're all of the components in your data center, but they can be more elastic than you could ever have in these rack systems. And as you're providing them, you can do it in a very multi-tenant way, making it very efficient and very automatable. So as we've launched this suite, we've really made massive advances across all of these different areas, and I want to just walk through each of them and give you a quick taste for what we've done. Now, we've certainly worked the longest in the compute space, and anyone who's been following us for a while now knows that we've done all kinds of things to make virtual machines strong and to make them very mobile. We've used DRS to move them around as you need uh, more capacity, also for availability reasons. But well, we're continuing to push forward very aggressively on this and leveraging all the capabilities coming out in modern CPUs along the way. So a lot of you are going to be in sessions this week that are talking about business critical applications. And this is the most important part, as we've gotten to that 60% number, and as we want to go forward, we want to make sure that all those applications that you're running your business on get virtualized as quickly as possible. This might be Exchange or SharePoint, SAP, Oracle, a lot of things that are really powering your overall systems. And so you have to deliver, obviously, performance for this, but you also have to make sure that you have the availability. 
You have to make sure that you have the security that's in place and really a focus on how you do this as well. So what I really liked watching in this is the number of white papers and architecture and sizing guides that are part of these business critical applications. And I'd encourage all of you to make sure that you really look at how others are doing it today so you can move from that 60% virtualized up until the 70, 80% realm. But what's also very exciting is thinking about where these next type of applications are gonna run. And we kind of on a joke last year uh, talked about the newest virtual machines and created this little character. I don't know if you remember him, but it turns out he actually has a Facebook page now. He's actually extremely popular. Uh, more friends than me, incidentally. Um, but I also want to say that we're making things even bigger in this new release. So we're making it so that he can be a bit stronger, more virtual processors. But what's most interesting to me is the focus we've had on I.O. And so you have to look a little carefully there. Last year we announced that we could do more than a million IOPS from a single host that's running virtual machines. Well, we're demonstrating and just launched a blog and white paper showing some work with partners where we're now able to drive a million IOPS from a single virtual machine. And this is really key to what we're gonna be able to do for these high-end business critical applications as we head forward. Now we put a lot of other uh, really cool stuff into the virtual machines. We have uh, guest NUMA awareness. We can handle performance counters in an interesting new way. So I'd encourage you to really dive in and understand that core compute aspect of things and, and how we're able to make it great for those business critical applications. One great example of this is a story that I absolutely love. So if you haven't heard of Epic, they're the leading healthcare uh, EMR, EHR provider, really focused on uh, medical records and making them be available for everybody. This is obviously a very demanding application. They have great technology, especially around the database technology. Uh, they have a high performance object database called Cache. And uh, what's been really interesting is that previously this only was available on non-x86 mid-range systems. And for the first time a couple weeks, they announced that they're gonna make it available on top of Linux and on top of x86, which was pretty cool. But what's even more cool is that that is only supported in turn when that is running on top of vSphere. So a really cool example of how people are now trusting this base literally for something where lives depend on it. And uh, very happy to have Epic working with us on us. And again, it's an example of how we can really move the most secure and critical applications to this infrastructure. Now, even as we're focusing on the existing applications, we're spending quite a bit of time looking at those islands that Pat mentioned. We wanna make sure that as you're looking at the next generation of applications, you put them on the same virtualized infrastructure. We can avoid those silos that have not yet been created if we really think carefully about this. And that's what we're doing. You'll be able to hear a little bit about efforts that are going on around all sorts of new applications. Uh, this might be around, for instance, telephony. Last year we announced some pretty interesting things around unified communication applications. They're able now to run on top of this platform and getting a lot of traction. But we're even seeing the beginnings right now of doing protocol processing, the stuff that lives in the RNCs that's powering all your wireless networks. And the reason we can do this is for the first time with hardware and software advances, we can really satisfy very tight latency needs with this platform. And we can avoid jitter and things that make it tough to get the predictability you need. So it's a very exciting uh, move that's uh, happening in this industry so that we can run even more of these applications. As Pat mentioned, vFabric, the way that people are writing all sorts of new web applications and a variety of other new applications, we're focusing quite a bit to make sure these run extra well whenever they run on top of the vSphere platform. And the same goes for things like high-performance computing. Again, for the first time we're seeing people not afraid to run it on these virtualized platforms. Lastly, we're also focusing on things like big data, and certainly on Cloud Foundry. So as Pat said, Cloud Foundry is definitely about running your applications anywhere in this new open platform as a service, but I can assure you the vSphere engineers are working very hard to make sure the best place to deploy it will continue to be the vSphere platform. Now you see a little elephant up there. I wanted to take just a minute and talk about big data. Uh, this is certainly one of the terms that everyone is hearing and there are so many proof of concepts going on right now to think about how to get more out of this massive amount of data, how to do more analytics with it. And Hadoop is one of the leading approaches to this, an open source approach to map reduce. So at first people thought, no way you should run this on top of vSphere, it's, it's a separate thing that you should do. But we started working quite a bit on the performance side of it and are doing very well, we have some great performance numbers out there. But then we got to thinking, maybe we could do even more. And that led to the launch of something we have called Project Serengeti an open source approach to deploying and getting more out of Hadoop when running on top of this new cloud suite. So I wanna take a quick look at this with uh, Richard, who's a friend of mine. He's gonna show us what we've done with Project Serengeti. Hey. hey Richard. Hey, how's it going? So yeah, we have done a, a lot of work on Hadoop and we found that we've got all the performance we need out of the platform for even the biggest analytics. A tremendous amount of work on performance and validating that it all works well. 
So we've also found that we can really leverage vSphere to take advantage of some of the core features and mix that with Hadoop and get a really a much better Hadoop environment. So for example, we've leveraged high availability in the platform to make it into a robust HA environment, which is what you would expect in an enterprise setting now that you're using it for production jobs. So the other thing we've found is that we can make it super easy to provision, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the more advanced features. So imagine if you wanted a Hadoop cluster, and you would go along and say, how long would that take? Maybe three months to order all the equipment and get it set up and everything. So I can now give you a Hadoop cluster in just two minutes. And we can do that with everyone. Everyone can have their own Hadoop cluster in a virtual environment, so radically different. The last thing is elasticity. So in a physical environment, Hadoop has a lot of data in all the nodes, maybe a terabyte of data in every node. And so it makes it really hard to grow and shrink. Like our web applications, we can scale them. But with a Hadoop application, you don't really want to add and remove a node more than once a week or so because of the amount of data you've got to move. We have found that we can do something fundamentally different with virtualization. We can put the data node in a different virtual machine and the compute nodes in a separate set of virtual machines and all of a sudden make it completely scalable. So once you show us that here in this picture, I think we're going to show uh, changing needs of a, of a workload, right? Yeah. So here you have Hadoop. And so Hadoop during the day, we, want to, we might want to adjust some web logs on a web application. And so we're going to do clickstream analysis. And then at nighttime, we're going to add extra Hadoop workloads. And then in the morning, we're going to bring it back down so that Hadoop is just it's idling along and collecting the data. So we can really take advantage of Hadoop at the nighttime when the, when the system's less busy. OK, let's jump in and show us uh, Project Serengeti. So this is the first version of Serengeti. And Serengeti has. Um, is installed as a vApp. And you can see here, we've logged into the vApp, and what we want to do is create a cluster. So we have no Hadoop running anywhere. We can see we're just going to give it a name, and we've got a spec file to tell it how many nodes that we want to create, et cetera. So we'll just um, press return on that. And what it's doing is going off and creating all the virtual machines and all the networking and all the Hadoop parameters required to get that up and running. So if we flip over to Virtual Center here, you can see that here's all the VMs that are being created by the Serengeti system. We've installed a Hadoop distribution, configured, and they're all up and running. And by the time that finishes, Hadoop is ready to go. So incredibly easy to get your first Hadoop cluster up and running. So you can see this is just finishing up now. And now we have a Hadoop cluster uh, that's ready to go. I can log into it and run jobs on it. It's super easy. So if we go in a little bit further now, you can see here's our Hadoop cluster. It's all up and running. You can see our web application running at the same time. So we're going to show us changing the size of the Hadoop cluster. So here we have a, a parameter. We're going to set up six web instances, and we're going to set up two Hadoop instances. So this is during the day. I want to import my web logs into the system. I click stream, but not actually do any processing on it. The majority of the resources are going to the web workload. So as we kick that off, we're spinning up the web application, and we're shrinking uh, the size of the Hadoop cluster now down to two. So if we go back over to uh, VC, we can see we've only got two Hadoop compute nodes running. All the data nodes are still running, but two Hadoop nodes. And if we refresh the browser here on uh, the Hadoop console, we can see it's now shrunk down to two nodes. So here's my tiny Hadoop cluster for during the day. Let's, let's make it bigger then, how about? All right, so if we go over to, uh, back to the same, same script, we're gonna change now to two web instances and six Hadoop instance, instances and kick that off. And that's just gonna go off and resize the Hadoop cluster dynamically. So here we are uh, shrinking down. We'll go back to virtual center. And uh, we can see now if we refresh the screen now, we'll see Hadoop now has six nodes, six compute nodes. Now all the data was there. We didn't have to shift any data or anything. We've got 18 concurrent tasks. So we've just been able to go elastically up to the size we need. So Hadoop clusters on demand, easy to provision, and we can make them elastic. If we take a look at the performance tab here, we can see that the amount of CPU and memory uh, changed. So when we did that, we cranked up all these new compute node VMs, and Hadoop started using all the resource it needs to get that batch clickstream analysis during, done during the night. And you can see that around about not, uh, just after 9 a.m., then we're shrinking those resources down again. So fundamentally different way of running Hadoop. It's really Outstanding. Thanks, Richard. Thanks very much. So what you saw there is really a focus, again, on making sure we can run all of the existing applications that you have, really moving towards business-critical applications, but also really thinking ahead to avoid silos that you have not yet created. And uh, three breakout sessions on how we're doing big data, and I think they're all quite very interesting. So that's just a very quick look at what we're doing on the compute side of the world.
I want to talk for a moment about storage and availability. And actually, last year, we really showed in vSphere 5 what we mean by software-defined storage. We showed you storage pools where we can bring arrays together and make them logical pools that you can eat out of. We showed you uh, storage DRS, which will move things to meet your performance demands, I.O. controls to make sure that multi-tenancy works. We showed a whole lot of capabilities. And we also showed SRM, Site Recovery Manager, which is a very popular way to bring disaster recovery solutions into your data center. That's all been going quite well, but we've continued to really focus in this new suite on integrating it nicely into all the management tools and also a few new capabilities. The goal overall, though, is to make storage as simple as possible to manage and as efficient in the usage of the hardware as well as the management of it. So one thing I really like in this new release is something called enhanced vMotion. Obviously, vMotion is the core of so many things we do around availability and performance, but today we require that you have a shared storage array that connects two of the servers. If you think about it though, a truly software-defined data center should have no physical constructs that keep you from moving things around. And so in the latest suite, we offer a new form of live migration, one that doesn't require shared storage. We can leverage multiple arrays, we can leverage disks that happen to be directly attached to it. No need for shared storage, but really done a, a, got a good job of delivering great performance with this, even showing it on metro networks. So this is a way that you can bring vMotion again to a fully software-defined data center, and of course, things like DRS and our other capabilities build right on top of that. So I encourage you to check this out. A great way to use vMotion, also a great way to bring this to, uh, to lower environments in the SMB that might want to take advantage of it. Now, we're also doing something different here as we move forward with storage and availability, and we're showing off a number of different directions here. There's a lot of great things going on here, but we want to think about what's next. So we're talking about a world where it's very clear the majority of virtual machines will be the things that we're running on all of our hardware. And yet many storage arrays really focus on a whole different construct, something called a LUN. And there's a mismatch between these two. So one thing that we're showing is something that we call virtual volumes or VVOLs. This is a way to really pair up the virtual machine with the array. And I think you'll see this really indicative of what's happening. As the world moves forward towards all virtual machines, infrastructure will become more aware of it and treat it as a first tier citizen. So I encourage you to check out how we'll be designing this so that you can build arrays to talk directly at the virtual machine level. Another obvious trend going on right now is the presence of Flash. And so if you go out and buy servers these days, often you're gonna find uh, Flash embedded directly on it. So I'm also excited to announce that we're working to make Flash be a first tier citizen of the data center, just as with the CPU and the memory. So you'll see us pulling it together as a resource pool and allowing you to use resource controls and shares to allocate Flash out to your applications. Uh, in this breakout session, you can also learn as a partner how you can talk directly through an API to this Flash pool and use it for storage arrays or all sorts of other interesting things that we're working on. And then the last thing going on is really a recognition of some other trends happening in the industry right now. It's around certainly the new type of data that's growing everywhere, new type of application architectures that expect local access to disk, and even growing CPU power that wants to be really close to the data. So towards that end, we're also going to begin treating direct attached storage as a first tier citizen and apply the same principles of abstraction, pooling, and automation to bring this into your data center. And we're calling this a virtual SAN. I think it's going to be very interesting for a number of use cases and very well integrated into the suite as well. So I encourage you to check out that breakout session as well. Last but certainly not least is around networking and security. And the industry is obviously in a very significant period of change right now. And we think this is one of the areas that we all need to really focus on to deliver on the software-defined data center. And why is that? Well, we know that networking has lagged in many ways the evolution towards the cloud. There are many significant physical constructs that you're still aware of when you're in your data center. Oftentimes people rack up servers, they have top of rack switches, they'll have an end of rack hardware as well in many cases. And then as Pat also talked about, there's so many other services that you need to plumb into here and make sure that your applications can leverage. This is where you have IDS systems, you might have traffic management systems, firewalls, and you often want to have these also physically close to these servers that you're working with. Ultimately, you need to then connect them all, and it can be rather rigid when you connect them together. You have to know about things like subnets, and you have to know where things are actually connected. And ultimately, this slows up the provisioning and ultimately the automation that we want to do to be able to move fast in this cloud era. So I don't think we can realize the full efficiency and agility that we want to with the overall cloud approach unless we treat this differently. And that's why the industry at large is really attacking this problem in a big way. Let me show you how we attack this within the vCloud suite. 
Uh, lots of advances on this front, and first and foremost, it is about how do we abstract the physical network and provide a logical network? How can I ask for something without knowing what physically is beneath there? And for us, that starts with the vSphere distributed switch. We've done a huge amount of work on this in this new release to really make it ready for the enterprise. Uh, we have things like health check built into there, uh, configuration backup and restore, and a huge number of other capabilities that I encourage you to look at. But the next phase is really thinking about how do we not only provide these logical networks, but how do we let interesting services plumb right into these fully virtualized data centers? You want to have all the capabilities that you need when you're provisioning an application. And that's what we're able to do with vCloud Director and some of the other management tools that are part of this new suite. We can provide virtualized services from the network directly into this new logical construct of the virtualized data center. And last but certainly not least is then how do we assign these to an application? This is where we can really attack those days that are involved in a full provisioning of a production workload. As you'll see in a demonstration in a little bit, we want an application to be deployed, and it should inherit all of those services. It should just pick up exactly what it wants and do so quickly and safely. So that's how we're ultimately going to deliver on this front. Now, also shipping in this release for the first time is something we introduced last year. Logical networks that are based on something called VXLAN. This is an open uh, ecosystem initiative that we've talked about, and it really shows here in this event today. I want to encourage you to check out all the partners who have really embraced this as an approach to providing logical networks. But most importantly, it's a way to bridge your virtualized world to leverage all the advances going on in hardware and also to connect to non-virtualized parts of your data center. Uh, there are partners who are de delivering things and showing them in their booth today that I think you'll be fascinated by. Uh, server offload, so you can do it as quickly as possible. I saw a, a pretty interesting thing in the Emulex booth on this that you'll want to check out. Uh, we're looking at the switch ecosystem as well, which connects physical assets at layer two uh, directly into these VXLAN networks. Uh, some great stuff from Broadcom and Brocade and others that you'll see there. Now, we deliver something called Edge also, which is a very important part of this story. It's a layer three gateway service, and through this you can plumb in IP level services like firewalls right into the VXLAN and bringing IP connectivity as well. So interesting demonstrations you're gonna see on that front. And then also things like visibility, Riverbed is delivering monitoring tools so that you can look inside these logical networks as well. So it's incredibly exciting to see how fast this has grown and really become a way that we can all work together on delivering these logical networks. A couple of calls I wanted to say too, we've really been focused hard on the partner ecosystem as we move forward in this networking and security space. One of our tightest partners has been Cisco, and we've been partnering throughout the process both to deliver on VXLAN, but also to innovate in a number of other areas. So they'll be showing off in their booth today. Uh, you can see the Nexus 1000V and a number of new capabilities that fit right into the same ecosystem and plug right into vCloud Director to work with us. What's also exciting is the number of virtual services that can be integrated through this platform, really leverage the investments that you have in the Cisco deliveries and products that we have so far. Some great work on the server side as well, and really a way to provide consistent virtual and physical networking and security solutions. So I encourage you to go down to their booth and really see how they've embraced the same vision that we have here. Um, another neat one really, to me, shows how you can bridge today's physical world with the newly virtualized networking world. And that's an interesting demonstration that shows the power of these L2 gateways. Um, Arista has in their booth a really interesting demonstration that pulls together a lot of assets that many of you have in your data centers. They're showing how we can have a logical network running virtualized and then go through a physical switch in order to get out to physical assets. And the demonstration they have there shows uh, EMC's Isilon technology coming all the way through. Um, also, the F5 traffic management system is coming directly in. So these physical assets are bringing, uh, coming in directly to the virtualized network and really helping us deliver it. Um, so again, this is one of the most exciting things I've seen around our industry as of late. A lot of folks really recognizing the need to move to a software-defined networking and security world. And uh, again, I encourage you to really check out what all is going on the partnering front. It's quite exciting on this. Move forward, please. Thanks. Now, that was just a very quick look at the core components. We have moved beyond virtualization of the compute and the CPU and the memory to really make sure that we're talking to the storage and networking, availability and security. But really, the way you pull this all together is through management, or more accurately, we want to pull it together through automation. And the vCloud suite really focuses on this on a very big way. And what we spent the most time doing is trying to make it as simple and efficient to use. This really is the core to saving operational expenses throughout the data center. So I want to give you a little look about all the things going on on the management side, and then we're going to jump into a pretty compelling demo that shows how they all fit together. 
So I'm talking a lot about these, uh, these overall directions that we're headed to, but a lot of you spend a lot of your time directly within uh, Virtual Center and directly within vCloud. But let's step back a little bit and say, what are we ultimately trying to do around management? We all have a few different tasks that go on. If we're on the infrastructure side, our goal is to build clouds, or more accurately in this new world, we want to provide virtualized data centers. All of the components of a data center that we want to offer up to one of our departments, or if we're a public cloud, it's what we want to offer up to clients that want to come in and, and buy this infrastructure. So the first thing we have to do in management tools is create these clouds and create these virtualized data centers. The second thing is certainly how we then use them. How do we deploy applications safely and with the guarantees that they want around performance and availability? And then last, certainly not least, is something often overlooked, which is how do we manage the ongoing operations? How do we deal with infrastructure as things break or as demands come in differently? How do we track the performance of applications and modify them as needed? So these are the three tasks that we really focus on with the new suite. And I'll give you a quick preview of what's going on in each of these. And let's start with how do we actually create these clouds and how we create these virtualized data centers. So most of you do spend your time within vCenter and a lot of time within vCloud as well. In fact, for the purposes of this new suite, you really need to think about the lines between those two as blurring and day-to-day -day operations. They're ultimately trying to do the same thing, which is offer up virtualized data centers as efficiently as possible. Uh, one thing that you really like if you spend a lot of time in front of these tools is that the new suite offers a new full-featured browser-based web client. And uh, we've gotten a lot of early feedback on this. The ability to work from any of these browsers is obviously something more convenient. But we've always really, really focused on making it elegant and very easy to consume at the same time. So I'm just gonna give you a real quick tour here to, to give a flavor for what it's like. First, you're gonna log into vCloud Director. And here you see the nice, uh, elegant approach to combining everything together in one place. Uh, in this particular example, I'm showing that you have the clusters that make up your virtualized data center, cluster A and B inside the resource pool. But what you can do here is seamless ties with all of the other management tools that you're used to working with. So I just right-clicked here and I can instantly launch into the vSphere client if I want to dive even deeper and look at the performance and look at all the different aspects of what's ultimately building this up. And then ultimately you end up some nice screens that really help you as an administrator deal with this. I don't know if you can see it, it's a, it's a really cool concept is to have this notion of a leveling bar there that shows you just how balanced your cluster is. And again, very simply brings your eye to something that you might want to focus on. So I think overall you're gonna love this. Uh, the team's done a great job of doing something I think very elegant in design and very well executed. So it all starts with making your life easier as you're managing these, uh, these clouds that you're creating. One thing we also focused on quite substantially in this new client is extensibility. And extensibility is easy to talk about when you just talk about the user interface. But we started early on in thinking about everything that you might wanna be integrated into this. You wanna make sure that you're in the same inventory lists, you wanna be in the same alarms and triggers that are happening. You wanna have search actually talk to anything that you're working on in your infrastructure. So I'm very excited by the work that we've done with HP and EMC, Dell, Fujitsu, and many others in integrating clients to talk to their hardware directly in this new browser-based client. And I think you'll find this is a very easy way to have a single pane of glass that allows you to manage this very efficiently. Uh, these are shipping this year, and there's a number of others that are in the works. So I think you really like the extensibility model that we've brought into this new system. The other part of this on extensibility is thinking about how people are talking into these virtualized data centers. And we spent quite a bit of time enhancing the vCloud API. This is part of how we talk to the system and essentially do everything we can do with the user interface, but in a programmatic way. Uh, towards this, we have a whole lot of interesting integrations where people are building new user interfaces on top of it. Maybe they're customizing skins, or maybe they're actually doing automatic deployments through the same API. But what I also like about what we've done here is really made an extensibility model that's gonna to prove to deliver some new solutions. And it builds through the same vCloud API entry point, but what it allows our partners to do, or our customers to do, is build new as-a-service offerings that fit directly into our model. So you'll see a number of these coming out. People can actually build things like backup as a service that are coming through the same API, or they might build databases as a service coming through the same API. And the reason that matters is that they can in turn inherit all of the permissions, the multi-tenancy model, and really fit into the exact VDC model that ultimately we all wanna consume. But again, the end goal here is to create and manage fully software-defined data centers as easily and efficiently as possible. So again, you're gonna see some great partner announcements around this, and if you're a developer, I encourage you to check out the new vCloud API and all the language bindings that we're delivering with it for, as well. 
Now that was the first phase, very quick look at how do we create virtualized data centers, how do we offer them up to folks, but again, all of us in infrastructure should never forget that it's ultimately about running applications. So it's also exciting to talk about the suite in the context of how do we deploy applications. An application director for the first time is part of this new vCloud suite. It's an easy way to create, deploy, and even share your application blueprints. Uh, you'll see in a, in a demonstration in a moment how you can take a fairly complex multi-tier application and make it as easy to move around and share as a document. Ultimately, this is also going to deploy into the vCloud director, and this is how you can really make sure that all of those services that make up the long tail in deploying an application, make sure that they get automatically plugged into the application in the right place. And last, certainly not least, is how do you manage the ongoing operations of both the infrastructure and the application once it's out there? I can't emphasize enough that this is the part that often falls short. It's very easy in the cloud to get things started. It can be a lot more difficult to deal with things as they're inside there and running. So this is about dealing with breakages and dealing about different demands on your applications. The core of what we do here is VC operations, and the great suite that we have as part of this is something you're all gonna enjoy. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time showing this off last year. It's a comprehensive monitoring solution. It really calls out directly to you things around health and risk and efficiency in a very simple to consume scoreboard. But what's most important is that you can actually see roughly how things are doing, but you have the ability to dive down deep and really understand what's happening. Ultimately, you need that to troubleshoot and to get to the root of the problem. So I'm very proud of how the teams pulled it together in this high level view that can also dive down deep. And again, I wanna reiterate that we've thought that this is a very different view you have to take towards management in the cloud era. You can't stick in the world where you're doing change management database updates for everything that's happening. You have to really recognize that there's a lot of data coming and going and deal with it almost as a big data problem. And that's what the team has done here. Uh, we've extended it in significant ways over the past year, and you can learn a lot more in the management spotlight section. But this is really a great tool that I encourage you to look at. And I also don't want you to forget that the same suite that we're talking about is used certainly for building private clouds, but also for public clouds. And our ecosystem is alive and doing very well on this front. Uh, we have a variety of partnerships of different cloud offerings that are based on the same set of software. And our uh, highest end tier is called the vCloud Data Center Services Partners. We have a very rich ecosystem who is delivering on this uh, solution so that you can have compatibility between your private and public clouds. And I'm very excited today to announce the newest member, which is T-Systems. They'll be launching this service, and again, allowing customers to leverage what they have within their own data center, but certainly also leverage the public cloud when it fits their application or any other needs. Part of the suite, and really the recognition that hybrid clouds is the future, is our vCloud connector. And you'll hear a lot more about this, but it is an embedded part of the suite that allows you to connect your on-premise with your off-premise resources. And again, I'm gonna show you this in just a moment. Think of it as just a core part of how we deliver the cloud in the future. Now, uh, I wanna go through a quick demo here, but I thought I'd just ask, was anyone here for the Google goggles demo the other day? It was back pretty interesting where people were flying down from airplanes and riding bikes and all that. I know a few of you saw it. I think you're gonna find that was pretty lame demo compared to what you're gonna see here. So we're gonna cut over, and I've, uh, I've really put the pressure on Serge here. Serge is a, one of the top networking engineers at VMware, and he's been in the industry for 20 years, and he's really been able to see what you can do when you pull all of these capabilities together. So I think it's a very interesting demonstration, and we're gonna start with Serge showing us uh, how we create virtualized data centers in this new world. Sure, Steve, thank you. As Steve mentioned, we have went ahead and we're gonna actually show you how to create a virtual data center in Cloud Director. Now this year we went ahead and not just did the the server virtualization, but went above and beyond that. We're now virtualizing all of the end of row networking services, firewalling, load balancing, VPNs, and also allowing partners to plug in to leverage this framework. At the end of the day, you'll get a very consistent application deployment model that you can repeat and photocopy as many times as needed. So first we'll start is we'll actually create a VDC and we configure the, some of the compute parameters. We'll take the CPU quotas and the resources from the CPU side we'll need, memory side of things, and also number of VMs we'll need. Now in this case, we're creating a virtual data center for fine finance line of business, but in a public cloud environment, we can also use this for multi-tenancy and create different tenants in our vCloud partner deployed clouds. Next we'll do is, in this particular case, because it's finance department, we want some of the best storage, some of the highest IOPS and throughput capable, we'll choose the gold profile. Had you had different use cases, if you had dev test workloads running out there, you can choose a lower end storage available in the same VDC and that new feature for this year in Cloud Director. 
We'll then go ahead and actually start leveraging some of our VXLAN pieces. Now, VXLAN becomes very interesting here because typically our compute uh, placement engine and cloud director used to do a check and say, is there compute available to place a virtual machine or to actually place a uh, you know, workload on a given host? And, and there would be compute uh, capacity available. We'll go ahead and place it there. But the issue was network was not available. The VLAN wasn't there. Network services weren't there. Low balancer wasn't available there. So the placement engine would say no. With VXLAN, we actually federate across top of racks, end of row, gear, and also go across the data center within the data center itself. And there you can actually plumb in all of your partners, all of the folks that, that you might want to use for end of row services, a WAN optimizer, a load balancer from our partner, that's all possible here. Next, I think you've seen in some of Steve's slides as you had different silos you would create for a different zone, or for a different network, you would actually have different silos. The silos consisted of switches and routers and, and firewalls, and as, you, as your application would grow, your zone would grow, you would have to recreate that entire silo, which could be fairly expensive. So what we do here is we've virtualized all of the assets that the, from networking and security perspective that the VDC would need to run, and some of those pieces are VPN, load balancing, uh, various different security functions and networking functions that are required, and we also allow partners to come in and leverage those uh, in the same workflow in Cloud Director, to, whether it's a partner product or VMware product. Now in this case, we're gonna actually deploy a large edge uh, appliance that's 10 gig capable, that actually has one million concurrent session performance, uh, and it's also gonna be highly available, so you don't, ha don't have any outages and things like that. And we also spend a lot of time working with our service provider enterprise customers to enable a lot of IP address management features that you also will see here as well. Now, once we've actually gone ahead and deployed the edge devices, you now have enough capacity from firewalling and network uh, capabilities that you might need. And then what you will do as an admin, as a cloud admin or a virtual network engineer is slice up the IP addresses that are gonna be leveraged by this organization and by this particular virtual data center. Now here, we also leverage a lot of the vSphere features like network I.O. control, and we actually ensure that when the vShield Edge is deployed and it's metering traffic coming in and out of the data center or using a partner product, we can also make sure that there's no noisy neighbor problems. We can actually make sure that one, in a multi-tenant environment, one tenant does not overrun another tenant, and that's some of these shaping and rate limiting features available here. And lastly, we'll actually go ahead and create a VXLAN network to place our applications into. The VXLAN network will go across clusters, across pods, across even core routing infrastructure in the data center. And if you need to burst your app across the uh, different silos in the data center, it simply moves with application workload. And at this point, we have a virtual data center that's created. We'll see it available in Cloud Director. It's our financial prod VDC, as you see here. And now we'll actually go ahead and show you how to actually put applications in this virtual data center. Yeah, so what you just saw, the first part of the demo here is really the same way that we let you create virtual machines very simply and through a very simple workflow. We've now extended that to literally creating an entire virtualized data center. All of the components that you might wanna put into it, as well as some of the limitations that you might have for multi-tenancy and really all the things you need. So if uh, Serge weren't talking, you'd see it was even faster, the ability to do this, and it's very a key part of it. So now we're gonna move from uh, Serge being the infrastructure provider to really someone who's using this cloud now and really trying to deploy an application as quickly as possible. So why don't we jump over to that? Thanks, Steve. So here we'll actually deploy a fairly complex multi-tier application that is a vFabric app, consists of TC server front ends, there's a load balancer requirement, there's multiple zones and firewalling requirement, there's a DB vFabric Postgres backend that's available there. And we're actually gonna show you how to, based on the infrastructure we already created, we're gonna go ahead and place these workloads from AppDirector. This is our blueprint that's actually available here. This this blueprint is created only once and we define exactly how much we want the frontier to scale out and contract as needed. We also specify the load balancer interaction and we specify the firewalling interaction. And we'll pick a target cloud of our choice. In this case, we'll pick the virtual data center we just created. We'll also take a look at what are the components in this application, uh, which, uh, and then we'll actually, once we've picked the components, we'll connect them to the different networking zones that we have. We have a database zone, we have an application zones, and we have actually pinholes configured between these zones that are firewalled rules that are available there. So again, as an application owner now, you just saw a very easy way that you could submit and do self-service and get your application deployed with exactly those pieces that you need. And as you'll see in just a moment, we're then able to watch things as they keep going and adjust on the fly. So now we're gonna to shift to the last part, very quick look at how we do ongoing operations. Right, and here once we placed the app, app director actually configured automatically, uh, it actually go, went ahead and pushed in the application into Cloud Director. We see this vApp up and running here. We'll also move, move to the edge gateway capabilities that are available 
for this app. And we'll see that load balancing has been configured, DHCP has been configured, and we'll walk you through those screens. Now these screens are self-serviceable. They're available to all the various admins that are not setting up the infrastructure, not the cloud admin, not the virtual network engineer, but specifically the person consuming this application. And here we've actually used the directives in IP address management and cloud director to assign DHCP via the VShield Edge device. Next, we'll actually show the load balancing configuration that was created by App Director by using the vCloud API. All of the things we're showing you here can actually be programmed to using the REST API, the vCloud API that we have. And all of the application traffic is actually funneled through the virtual IP address that's in the front of the vShield Edge device on the external network available to the physical layer uh, out there. Now, you could also take a, a load balancer of your choice, use the same screens, the same integration, and actually use that if it's your ADC of your choice. And finally, we're gonna actually show you how we construct the firewall rules in between the zones and the different uh, application uh, tiers that are available out there and to the front end where the virtual IP address hits the physical network. The edge is our demarcation point from the virtual VXLAN elastic networks to the physical networks. Great. So I think what's really interesting here, we've just seen an end-to-end -end demo that shows how you create virtual data centers and how you deploy applications. I think the really cool part that you might see is how we extend L2 networks along the way. Right, and so the use case here is now we've used up all infrastructure we have locally. Uh, as you saw in App Director, you can actually pick a number of front ends you would want, number of TC servers. We're gonna scale those up, but eventually we run out. So now we can actually go to the vCloud connector view and the vCloud Connector product actually shows us local assets running within the data center here, and also we'll see what's available in the public cloud in a vCloud-enabled service provider partner of, of, of your choice, the ISP you'd want to use for that use case. Now here we see the same uh, uh, app running actually locally. That's the NanoTrader financial app that we put out in the VDC. And if we look at the inventory of the virtual machines that's available here, we're gonna power down one of the TC servers that's here, and we're gonna show you how we're gonna actually burst that workload out into a vCloud provider of our choice. First we'll do is we'll do what we call a stretch deploy. A stretch deploy, not only does it copy to the, from a local catalog to a remote catalog, the actual virtual machine, we'll also stretch the layer two network across a SSL VPN. It appears to be a web connection, but it's encrypted, and it supports all the broadcast, multicast, unicast capabilities across into the cloud. What that really means is that the IP address doesn't change as your workload moves into the cloud, MAC address doesn't change, and that same load balancer that's running in the local data center will actually continue to serve the workload as if it, it were local. Now in this case, we'll choose the catalog, uh, that's the local catalog that has the TC server VM. Then we'll choose the vCloud provider of our choice and uh, the name of the VM that's gonna be out there. And finally, we'll choose the stretch network that was available, in the, that was created in the previous steps and the destination virtual data center that's uh, running in a multi-tenant environment for you. And finally, we'll actually see uh, the same virtual machine running in the cloud with the network stretched and available and no IP semantics were changed, no load balancer reconfiguration required, no firewall rules needed to change, and we actually provide that elastic capability to the partner's cloud. Very cool, thanks, Serge. So that was a very, uh, a very short look at all the capabilities you can do. And again, the real key thing here we showed is a software-defined data center where you can create a virtualized data center, you can consume it and get all of the different services your application needs. And we even showed the power of a software-defined network. In this case, a layer two network extending across clouds and being seamless to those that are using it. So incredible set of technology and a lot more to learn about this at the event. So that is a quick look at the new vCloud suite. You're gonna have a number of breakout sessions here today where you can go through all this technology. Um, I only showed a portion of the new capabilities, uh, things like single sign-on, uh, built-in data protection, Windows 8 server support, vProbes. You're gonna hear about a lot of this, and so I really encourage you to learn. Now in the last uh, few minutes here, though, I wanna talk a little bit more about the multi-cloud multi side of the world that we were speaking to. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you one more thing about uh, ease of consumption of this new product as well. I saw that Pat skewered the VRAM uh, fairly well, but I also wanted to talk about two other things. Uh, we did wanna make the new suite as easy to use as it is to buy and consume, and so there are two key things that you wanna learn about as we head forward here as well. Uh, one of them is really thinking about very simple flavors of the vCloud suite. We've made it a very easy choice where you can choose kind of small, medium, large for what you need. But what I think is also very exciting is that we've also made it to upgrade. So those of you that are on vSphere Enterprise Plus, you get a free upgrade into the new cloud suite and the new capabilities that come with it. Uh, so I certainly encourage you to check it out. This is gonna be a very exciting way to get people moving forward.
Uh, now, in the next few minutes here, I wanted to talk a little bit more about addressing a multi-cloud world. And we really talked about that as something we've heard very clearly, is that people want to obviously build the best possible cloud they can with the products, but they want to be able to interoperate with other clouds or other pools of infrastructure that are around. And as Pat and uh, Paul both talked about, this talks on a few different layers. Certainly a year ago, we started Cloud Foundry with the express intent to make sure it could run anywhere. In fact, we demonstrated it running on Amazon day one and continue to work on all the different pools of infrastructure. But as we also talked about, we've been very busy in two new areas, thinking about how you do automation and orchestration in a multi-cloud world, as well as how you use networking in this multi-cloud world. And I can't emphasize enough that these are the things that really have to connect everything together and make you as efficient as possible. So first I wanna show you just a little preview of what's going on around the networking side of things. And I have to tell you, we actually closed this acquisition Friday, so there's a lot of tension over uh, what I'd be able to show or not. So uh, very excited to have the NICERA joint team join us. Uh, this is the team that created originally OpenFlow and software-defined networking. And just a few things to take away. Uh, they're the leader in networking virtualization for heterogeneous infrastructure and different clouds that are in place. Pat emphasized this, and I want to say it again. They're very powerful in working with a great community, working on Open vSwitch, Open with Quantum, with a, which is an API in the OpenStack community. And we're absolutely committed to making that continue to evolve and work well. And then together, the ultimate goal here is how do we bring networking software together in a distributed system fashion that allows us to really deploy these networks anywhere and then do rich add-on services so that we can ultimately all be more efficient. So we're gonna go back to Surge for just a minute and show an initial pull together we've done to show Nasira in action. So Surge, let's take it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we're really excited about this particular demo because it shows that networking connects all the hypervisors, all the compute, and in this particular case, we'll go into Cloud Director and we'll actually go ahead and create a new network. This network is gonna be in a cross-platform extended network, as we call it, and we'll actually connect it to the same exa exact edge device that was serving up the data center that we have here. We'll go ahead and give it the same IP address management capabilities of Cloud Director. We'll give it the DNS capabilities of the Edge device. And uh, when we see this wizard complete, we'll create a uh, cross-platform network that's not only going to be available in the VMware stack, but will extend out to other pools of compute as well. So you can take some of your workloads that are running on those and connect them to the same Edge services. You can also connect the, the higher end uh, uh, VMs running on the vSphere to some of the other workloads running out there. And we move on to the Nasera's uh, NVP gateway and NVP uh, uh, controller, where you'll actually see the new network being created here. This is the same network name, and they're really federated and connected together. And what brings it all together is the notion of the NVP gateway that actually sits in the vSphere stack and connects the VXLAN to Nasera's encapsulation technology. And uh, in this case, we're finished, and we actually have the complete network working end-to-end -end between the open stack and uh, using the quantum API. And on the left-hand side, you will see actually the, the vSphere sphere side of things. You see the diagnostics that the Sarah folks have built that's uh, very appealing to the network engineering community out there and uh, connecting out to the non-vSphere stack on the right side. Cool, thanks. So that was a very quick look and you're going to hear a lot more on this front. But what we're really trying to do here is show how we can connect the pools of infrastructure that you've created with vSphere and really tie that in directly into other pools, in this case an OpenStack cloud that's been built up. And most importantly, we're using vCloud Manager to manage and, and really to talk to it with new services. So thanks very much, sir. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all. Uh, that was also done with all the existing APIs. As I said, we just closed on Friday, so wait till you see when we do even more together as things move forward here. Uh, another recent addition to the VMware family is Dynamic Ops, which spun out of the Credit Suisse IT department and uh, really popular in our existing customer base as a way to govern self-service provisioning of infrastructure and applications and even desktops. And again, the key thing here is it provides choice so that it can deploy to virtual or even the physical world or even multi-cloud world. And the most important thing for a lot of the enterprise customers using this is that it really works with the workflow that you need to go through. You can integrate it with your IPAM or CMDB or your, or your uh, ticketing systems to really make sure things are following the business process that you might have in place. And ultimately, this makes the clouds then be hands-off, give you self-service access, but it still satisfies your compliance needs and makes sure things work. Uh, so the end result is really a, a, an easy-to-run cloud, and I'm told I'm actually gonna run this demo. That's how easy it is. Just gonna show you a real quick look at what this looks like as a customer today. So let's cut over to the dynamic ops screen. Here I'm a developer and I'm getting self-service access to an infrastructure cloud that's been offered. In fact, there are several types of pools of infrastructure. So here let's go in and I wanna choose a new application that I'm gonna use as a developer, a distributed app in this case. And uh, here I'm gonna put in a few of the things that my IT department wants to know, how long I need it and what cost center I'm in. Let's click again. 
And this is the key screen here. This is where it can then say, there are the different options that I might have offered, places that I could possibly run. And then it's gonna give me suggestions based on all sorts of things for the type of application I want, how much might it cost. Maybe it knows something about the data that I have and where it has to reside. But ultimately it makes a choice. It lets me make my choice and click next here. And then is where it hands off to the cloud at this point. It doesn't actually do the deeper dive provisioning, but it lets the engines handle it. So in this case, I'm gonna talk now to vCloud Director, put in a few of the traits that allows me to show through here, such as what level of security. And as I click next, it's gonna be deployed. It'll tell me how much it's gonna cost me, and it'll fit right into the integrated systems that I might have had plugged into my workflow. And we'll click finish. And we'll just quickly show you here that it is now through the provisioning status and has been ultimately sent out. So let's just do a quick click there and show that it is actually up and running now. Uh, so this is a bit of a sped up version. Click here, please. And you can see now uh, what we've shown you very briefly here is the notion of really helping us choose among heterogeneous pools of infrastructure and ultimately deploy our application based on things like the price or the cost center that I'm in, or ultimately specific traits that I need to know about when I deploy these. And again, I just wanted to give you a real quick flavor for it and invite you to learn a lot more as we get further integrated with the tool, make it work extremely well with vCloud Director, of course, but also preserve its ability to work in a heterogeneous environment. So we're quite excited about uh, these two new members of the family and really a strategy that's embracing heterogeneity and making sure that it works well with your existing environments. Now we're almost to the end here and I wanted to step back a little bit after showing you the new cloud suite, after showing you how we do multi-cloud and just talk a little bit more about where we're headed. Sorry, one second. And that is really the engineering department. And uh, there's a great spotlight session right after this that I encourage you to check out around innovation. And our R&D department continues to think about where things are heading. And we give them these really hard problems and say, come up with something kind of wild about this. And uh, the poster child for a wild example is something I want to just give you a quick preview of. Uh, my friend Ravi here thought it'd be cool to combine social networking with managing the cloud. And I think you'll be excited by the results here. Thanks, Steve. So I'm in the performance group, as you know, and I was trying to figure out how to leverage social media concepts to make it as easy to manage my virtualized environment as it is to manage my hundreds of friends on Facebook. So I decided to come up with this. So what you see here is you see my social cast powered social network and you see virtual infrastructure. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and populate my social network. So when we're populating this social network, we're not just adding users. What we're actually doing is mapping the relationships between the, the virtualized entities and themselves, and then putting those relationships into the social network. And as soon as this is done, I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, let's, uh, let's dive right in. You've made yep. some new friends. Yeah, I've made a lot of new friends, more than I actually have. So let's go ahead and navigate to a host. We see that this host is running two virtual machines. Let's see how we map that into social media. So let's go ahead and we go to the company directory. As you can see, instead of just having humans, now we have our VMs and our hosts, etc. So let's click on the very same host. What you see is that this host's friends are its virtual machines. Now this isn't just some sort of eye candy, it's actually really useful to think about these connections. And let me give you an example. So, what we're gonna do is I've got this VM right here. Okay, this VM is, is running an NFS data store and I've got a bunch of hosts connected to that data store. Okay, okay. now I'm gonna show you some things, but let me set it up a little bit. Imagine you're Michael Phelps and you've just won your 20th gold medal at the Olympics. What happens? You know, you get one message that says congratulations and 167,000 likes. Okay, let's use that kind of reduction of information here. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off this VM and that's gonna turn off the data store. Here's the quick question. What hosts are affected and how many? Mm -hmm. Let me show you how we can figure that kind of thing out. So let's go ahead and navigate to our social network. What we can see is that the very first host that sees this problem is gonna go ahead and post a message. Every other host or VM that's affected, rather than barraging you with more and more information, it just goes ahead and likes the previous message. <laughs> Instantly you can see exactly how widespread this problem is. Not only that, let's go ahead and click on this link and you can see more information about what hosts are actually affected or VMs. 
pretty cool. Now there's more that we can do with this. Let's now you might notice on the screen that we're using hashtags. We can use the concept of hashtags and social media analytics to do even more interesting things. So you know this is being deployed in the hands-on lab, and one common thing that we see in the hands-on lab is you know we'll announce a product and a bunch of people are going to go and try to use that lab, and you see all this back-end activity. It'd be nice if we could think of interesting ways to debug what's going on and better optimize our products. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to start a load against my vCenter server, and I'm going to show you how we can do some of this. So we go ahead and start our load. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to an analytics page where I show you a splash of, oh, by the way, here what I'm showing you is that all of these, I've increased the verbosity kind of for dramatic impact. But the point is, is that you've got all these tasks being executed. They're going into this message stream. Most of them are successful tasks. Thank you, vSphere. And we're going to go ahead and go to the analytics tab and show you how we can visualize this. So as you can see, we've just started a whole bunch of tasks, and at a glance, I can see exactly what kind of activity is going on. Now let's go back to the concept of hashtags. Let's go ahead and see what we can use those for. Because we've used hashtags, we can categorize things. This is this kind of task, this is this kind of CPU issue, disk, et cetera. At a glance, we see exactly the breakdown of the workflow that's going on, and I can feed that back and try to figure out how to make our product better. Very cool. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Steve. So, you know, uh, when we started this effort, it actually sounded like a pretty crazy idea. Um, but, it, you know, it turns out we're using it now in the hands-on lab, and it actually is proving to be pretty interesting. So it's a real good example of we'll, we'll address problems in a new way. And I actually expect we're going to see a lot more about this. It's also a good way to increase your friend count if you're feeling like you need to. So check it out in the uh, Innovation Spotlight and in the Innovation Lounge that we have set up. And I did just mention the labs, which I wanted to close on here. You know, the labs are really one of the most exciting things about this environment. And, uh, you know, I, I know there, there were several thousand people here yesterday, Sunday morning, getting going. In fact, the lines were quite long. We apologize for that. But this year, we're offering literally 27,500 lab seat hours, which is crazy. And we expect we'll go through 200,000 virtual machines in the process of doing this. Uh, this is all running on the products that we've just shown you here today. So this is really trial by fire to make sure that we're ready for all the environments that might be in place here. Uh, the architecture is something that you might be using for very large uh, cloud environments. And as I said, we're using almost every product in the portfolio, from the vCloud suite that we've talked about, uh, to vFabric to build the applications, and to Vue to consume them. Um, and I also just wanted to close on that note, because I think we all come here to learn quite a bit, but you also heard Rick talk about how we're here as a community. And uh, I just want to call out a real thanks to everyone who's in the vMug group. It's really just a great example of a community working together. And I thought I'd show you that uh, I might be the CEO but I'm also a VMUG member. <laughs> so I definitely encourage you to work with them and check it out. And more importantly, I think that's a good way to get to know from one another uh, what else can happen, what are the challenges you're facing. So again, that's why I really love the labs. That's why I really love VMworld. And so I want to close on though, just bringing us back to the start. We're really talking about this massive transformation going on all across IT. And today we really spent a little time talking about how we move from physical servers to building entire virtualized data centers. And that concept is going to be so profound when you really get used to working that way. We talked just a little bit about how applications are being transformed as well. And lastly, I want to close by saying you should absolutely come back tomorrow at 8.30. We have a very interesting set of discussions on how do we ultimately consume these applications in an increasingly mobile world. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great VMworld.